We've been going through the prophetic chain. Uh, this is part five. This isn't so much identifying a link in the prophetic chain. We've defined the link of the chain as the 3-1 combination. Uh, but this is a, a study that I chose to insert in here that I hope helps provide a little background information when we get to the conclusion of the prophetic chain. And this study begins on page 31 of your notes. And uh, we understand, those of us that are studying this prophetic message, that the Millerite history is being repeated here in this our day. And one of the characteristics of the Millerite history that we've been informed took place in that time period is that the Millerites came to recognize a certain set of rules that allowed them to understand and proclaim the message of their time. Therefore, if the Millerite history is going to be repeated to the very end at the end of the world, God's people at the end of the world are going to recognize a certain amount of prophetic rules that they will employ to identify and proclaim the message of our time. Um, one of those rules, I believe, is a triple application of prophecy. You can see a triple application of prophecy in several lines of God's prophetic word. And one of them that I want to put in place for us, a triple application of prophecy here this hour, is uh, the triple application of prophecy in the book of Joel. Okay, if you're on page 39, or if you want to turn to Joel, verses, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, this is where we're going to begin. Everyone at Joel. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your day, or even in the days of your fathers? Has what been? He's, he's going to describe a circumstance. Circumstance of a progressive degeneracy of, spiritual, of spirituality in God's church. Has this condition ever existed in your days or in the days of your fathers. Okay? Tell your children of it and let your children tell, tell their children and their children another generation. That's four generations. Amen. If the old men tell their children and those children tell their children and those children tell their children, that's four generations and four generations in the Bible. As Brother Duane was dealing with this morning, marks the period of grace that's given to each nation that comes on the scene of history. And it's at that fourth generation line that the cup of their probationary time is filled up. The cup of their iniquity. The Amorites had, to, had the, the probationary time of four generations. And in the scriptures, four generations represents his probationary time. Exodus 20 verse 5 says, Thou should, And I'm, I'm using the notes. Okay, I'll give you a little bit of time. I'm, and I just soon you use your Bible. But I want to get through this material on time. So I'm going to move a little bit quick here at the beginning. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers unto the children, of, unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. Iniquity visited, fourth generation. Joel's talking about the fourth generation. And who's Joel speaking about? Pastor Emiliano, last presentation, very clear. All the prophets speaking about the end of the world. Joel speaking about the end of the world. Joel speaking about God's people at the end of the world. He's talking about God's people at the end of the world that are in the fourth generation of their prophetic history. This is the point where the iniquity in the cup of Adventism has reached its limit. This is the story of Joel. Okay. Genesis 15, 15 and 16 says, And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age, but in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Fourth generation has to do with the filling up of the cup of iniquity. Um, Sister White deals with this in connection with Ezekiel 8 and Testimonies, Volume 5, page 207. She says this, he cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw. I want to say something here. If, if all, were all of you here for the last presentation? Yes. You know, there's something, something that Emiliano said that was, uh, you know, kind of caught my eye. Maybe it caught your eye. Um, he was telling us that the sign of the, the covenant for the 144,000, and we think we're living in the generation of the 144,000. He was telling us what the sign of the covenant was. And it seemed like everybody said, Amen. But that's not what we've been teaching, is it? What we've been teaching for a long time is this, the sign. What's our sign? 
9-11 is the sign, isn't it? Why is 9-11 the sign? Well, because Islam was restrained, but, but why is that the sign? And someone said it. In, in Great Controversy, speaking of Luke 21, Jesus, Dale and White said, Jesus pointed his followers to what? The budding trees of spring, and what causes the trees to bud out in the springtime? The latter rain. So from that line of logic, you can show that on September 11th, 2001, the latter rain began to sprinkle, and we are required to what? Recognize the latter rain. That's our sign, or token, is it not? So we've been teaching that the latter rain is the sign, and he was saying the sign is what? A rainbow. How, how, how do you get a rainbow? <laughs> with, the, with the rain, brothers and sisters, I hope we see that, that that is the sign of the covenant, is the latter rain, right? Okay. Okay. All right. Moving on. He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And he called to the man with linen, clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in my hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Pity slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they begin at the ancient men which were before the house. Of course, this is Ezekiel 8 and 9. And when they begin to slay, when, they be, when do they begin to slay? When the 25 men are bowing down to the sun in Ezekiel 8. Okay, this is Sunday law time period. Sunday law time periods, Adventism, all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. Ezekiel 9 is the sealing of God's people, and Sister White says the sealing of Ezekiel 9 is the same sealing as Revelation 7. But she says of this, Jesus is about to leave the mercy seat of his heavenly sanctuary to put on garments of vengeance and to pour out his wrath and judgments upon those who have not responded to the light, to the light God has given them. Why is he going to judge them? Now responding to the light. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Why isn't sentence carried out immediately? Process of time. Process of time. What's that mean? Why isn't sentence poured out immediately? Why isn't it poured out immediately? Be because God gives them four generations to fill the cup before it's poured out. Four generations, right? Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully to set in them to do evil. Instead of being softened by the patience and long forbearance that the Lord has exercised toward them, those who fear not God and love not the truth strengthen their hearts in their evil course. But there are limits even to the forbearance of God, and many are exceeding these boundaries. They have overrun the limits of grace, and therefore God must interfere and vindicate His own honor. Of the Amorites, the Lord said, in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. Notice this is Sister White tying together this concept of the fourth generation. The fourth generation for Adventism is the Sunday law. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Although this nation was conspicuous because of its idolatry and corruption, it had not yet filled up the cup of its iniquity. And God would not give command for its utter destruction. The people who were to see the divine power manifested in a marked manner, that they might be left without excuse. The compassionate Creator was willing to bear with their iniquity until the fourth generation. Then, if no chain, change was seen for the better, His judgments were to fall upon them. With unerring accuracy, the Infinite One still keeps an account with all nations. Is Adventism a nation? Modern Israel, he's keeping an account with us. While his mercy is tendered with calls to repentance, this account will remain open. But when the figures reach a certain amount, which God has fixed, the ministry of his wrath commences, the account is closed, divine patience ceases, there is no more pleading on, of mercy 
in their behalf. The prophet, looking down through the ages, had this time presented before his vision. The nations of this age have been the recipients of unprecedented mercies. The choices of heaven's blessings have been given to them, but increased pride, covetousness, idolatry, contempt of God, and based ingratitude are written against them. They are fast closing up their account with God. But that which causes me to tremble is the fact that those who have had the greatest light and privileges, who's that? Adventism, have become contaminated by the prevailing iniquity. So who's she speaking about? Primarily, Adventism, fourth generation, Adventism. Influenced by the unrighteous around them, many, even of those who profess the truth, have grown cold and are borne down by the strong current of evil. The universal scorn thrown upon true piety and holiness leads those who do not connect closely with God to lose their reverence for His law. If they were following the light and obeying the truth from the heart, this holy law would seem even more precious to them when, it, when thus despised and set aside. As the disrespect for God's law becomes more manifest, the line of demarcation between its observers and the world becomes more distinct. Love for the divine precept increases with one class, according as contempt for them increases with another cl class. All right. Fourth generation is where Joel places his history. That's the context of Joel. Okay. I, re I referenced this next passage in a previous presentation, so I'm just going to refer to it. Okay. This is Jeremiah 25. This is where Daniel recognized the 70 years captivity. And this is where after... Uh, he, he, he puts in place the seven years captivity. Jeremiah is given a cup to carry to every nation. And the first nation he carries that cup to is Israel, Jerusalem. Adventism is judged first. Judgment begins with the house of God. And this is very clearly laid out here in Jeremiah 25. And if you go to page 41... It says, judgment begins with Adventism. You can read Jeremiah 25, verses 9 through 18 at your leisure to see if I gave a correct representation of that. But moving on to Testimonies, volume 5, page 210. It says, the command is, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Here we see that the church... The Lord's sanctuary, when, when Ezekiel is talking about Jerusalem in Ezekiel 8 through... 10, 12, chapter 12, that Jerusalem is the Seventh-day Adventist church at the end of the world. All right. Here we see that the church, the Lord's sanctuary, was the first to feel the stroke of the wrath of God. The ancient men, those, who, those to whom God has given great light and who stood as spiritual guard, guardians of, of the spiritual interests of the people, had betrayed their t trust. They had taken the position that we need not present the health message as set forth in the writings of Ellen White. They had taken the position that it was safer to live in the cities now than to go into the country. Is that what it said? <laughs> this is so crystal clear what their position is. This is so crystal clear about the truth that they reject in order to receive the mark of the beast and spe be spewed out of the mouth of the Lord. It says they had taken the position that we need not look for miracles and the mark manifestation of God's power as in former days. Times have changed. The midnight cry in the history of the Millerite, which is a fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel, it doesn't get repeated at the end of the world. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost does not get repeated at the end of the world. They had taken the position that we need not look for miracles and the marked manifestation of God's powers as in former days. This is the position that brings them the mark of the beast. Right? Is that, I mean, is that, am I twisting that one? Times have changed. This isn't, this isn't the time of Pentecost or the time of the Millerites. This is the 21st century. We have... How many gigabytes can we get on one of those little flash drives? We can get all this whole message from all these ministries on one little thing. And I heard someone tell me today, and, and they were, or, or yesterday, and, and they're being accurate. And you can put it in your pocket. The whole message in your pocket. This is a different day and age in the Millerite history. Different day and age than Pentecost. We need not look for the marked manifestations of God's power as in former days. 
and the manifestation of power of Pentecost and the midnight cry were both fulfillments of the prophecy of Joel. Amen. And they were both prefiguring the perfect fulfillment of Joel here at the end of the world. Because Joel is a triple application of prophecy. Joel is the triple application of prophecy that identifies the three comings of Christ. Christ came to the heavenly sanctuary at Pentecost and when he began his work in the heavenly sanctuary, what did he do to tell his disciples on earth that he had begun his work? He poured out his Holy Spirit. Sister White says, though, that was the sign to his disciples that he had began his work in the holy place. And when he began his work in the most holy place, what did he do? When he came to the most holy place, his second prophetic coming, he came the first time to the heavenly sanctuary, his first prophetic coming, he poured out his spirit to mark it. When he came to the most holy place in 1844, he poured out his spirit in the midnight cry to mark it. And both of those fulfillments are pointing forward to the time period when he comes to the judgment of the living and he marks it by pouring out his spirit. And all three of those histories are the history of Joel because Joel is a triple application of prophecy. They had taken the position that we need not look for miracles and the marked manifestation of God's powers in former days, times of change. These words strengthen their unbelief and they say the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. He is too merciful to visit his people in judgment. <coughs> Thus peace and safety is the cry for men who will never again lift up their voice like a trumpet to show God's people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. These dumb dogs that would not bark are the ones who feel the just vengeance of an offended God. Men, maidens, and little children all perish together. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 210. 1 Peter 4, 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of Christ? That's Joel, verses 1 through 3. Joel's placing the setting of the book of Joel with the question, has this ever been in our day, in your day? Tell your children, let them tell their children, and let them tell their children, that's four generations. Four generations according to the Word of God. Cup of iniquity full, cup of iniquity full. When the 25 elders are bound down to the sun in Ezekiel 8. And Sister White ties, ties that in with the four generations. But Joel's going to add to that. By the way, in Ezekiel 8, when the elders end up bowing down to the sun, it is illustrated an escalation of apostasy. How's it, How's it illustrated? Well, there's four idolatrous manifestations in Ezekiel 8. The fourth is the Sunday worship, but the first is less of an abomination than the second, and the second is less than the third, and the fourth, it's the the climax of them all. So there's a four-step progression there in Ezekiel 8 of escalating apostasy. Right? Everyone familiar with that? So notice verse 4. That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. Four insects doing their work of destruction over these four generations, identifying that the four generations of Adventism has been nothing but downhill, all right, until the cup's full at the time that the sealing angel is going through and putting the mark on those that sigh and cry for the abominations. These four insects are paralleling Ezekiel 8. What's four mean typically? Worldwide. This isn't just in your church. It's not just in my church. It's in Adventism all around the world. All right. New York Indicator. I knew this quote. I've known this quote for a long time. I went to look this quote up on the CD-ROM. It, it's probably somewhere out, else, but I don't know how to bring it up. And I brought up this quote from New York Indicator and for me, this is like the first time I ever heard of the New York Indicator. 
All right, but I, I, it's, it's on the CD-ROM, and I'm familiar with this quote without remembering what the reference I learned it from was, but New York Indicator, February 7th, 1906, says this. One thing is iffy. One thing is certain. One thing it is certain is soon to be realized, the great apostasy which is developing and increasing and waxing stronger and will continue to do so until the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout. Wow. I didn't read that right. It's putting the emphasis the wrong way. One thing it is certain is soon to be realized the great apostasy which is developing and increasing and waxing stronger and will continue to do so until the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout. We are to hold fast the first principles of our denominated faith and go forward from strength to increased faith ever we are to keep the faith that has been substantiated by the Holy Spirit of God from the earlier events of our experience until the present time. To me and my, you know, I've had one brother, school teacher, as often happens, he's came to me here in this meeting, but it happens all over the place, and tried to give me a quick lesson on my English grammar. And I just didn't forget about it, man. Can't teach the old dog new tricks. My English grammar is not good, but the little bit I remember about paragraph structure is the, the first, the opening sentence is identifying the main theme and then the next couple sentences are just building on that theme and this great apostasy that she says continues until the Lord returns. It has to do with the rejection of the foundational truths. Is that how you read that? Okay. We need now... We need now larger breath and deeper, more earnest, unwavering faith in the leadings of the Holy Spirit. If we needed the manifest proof of the Holy Spirit's power to confirm truth in the beginning after the passing of time, we need today all the evidence in the confirmation of the truth when souls are departing from the faith and giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. There must not be any uh, languishing of soul now. Amen. So there's an apostasy marked in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy that takes place in Adventism that escalates until the fourth generation when the cup, our probationary time, is at its end. And this is the setting for Joel. And then in verse 5 it says this, Awake ye drunkards and weep, and howl all you drinkers of wine because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. There's two wine, two, two wine drinkers in the book of Joel. There's the drunkards of Ephraim that are identifying that those that drink the new wine are drunk, but those that drink the new wine aren't drunk. And the drunkards of Ephraim, they don't get the new wine. Why? Because it's cut off from their mouth. And when do the drunkards wake up? That's an easy one for here, all right? When do the drunkards wake up? Who is this? Who's it speaking about? Who's Joel speaking about? Adventism at the end of the world? When does Adventism at the end of the world wake up? The seven plagues? Sunday law? I heard something out there. Next quote. Great Controversy 393. The parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 also illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. When do the virgins wake up? At the midnight cry. Which virgins wake up at the midnight cry? All the virgins. Those that are drinking the new wine and the drunkards of Ephraim. And when they wake up, when the wake up time comes, the drunkards of Ephraim, the new wine's cut off from them. Review and Herald, February 11, 1896. There is a world lying in wickedness and deception and delusion in the very shadow of death. Asleep, asleep. Sister White, a prophet? Amen. <laughs> asleep, asleep, awake, awake. Fallen, fallen. Okay, this is, this is the fourth angel messy time period, right? Who are feeling the travail of soul to awaken them? What voice can reach them? My mind was carried to the future when the signal will be given. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out to meet him. But some will have delayed to obtain the oil for replenishing their lamps. And too late they will find out that character, which is represented by the oil, 
is not transferable. The drunkards of Joel wake up at the midnight cry at the end of the world. What's the midnight cry? You, know, you get this question, you deal with the midnight cry, you get this question, I'm sure many of the messengers here have got this question. It's a bad question. You know, somebody presents you with the parable of the ten virgins, they say, what was the midnight cry that wakes up the virgins? It couldn't have been the virgins because they were all sleeping. And they're, they're, they're making a case that there's some kind of other being, whether it's another human being or an angelic being, that's there in the parable of the ten virgins just by inference. But we don't have to go down that road, do we? We know what the midnight cry is. What was the midnight cry? Pardon me? That's the message of the midnight cry. But what is the midnight cry? What was the midnight cry? It was a message that was presented at a camp meeting by Samuel Snow. It was a message that was directly connected to the message of the hour. What was the message of the hour? Daniel 8.14. Wasn't that the message of the hour for the Millerites? Daniel 8.14, under 2300 days, then Jesus returns in 1843. That's what they believed, right? That was the message of the hour, but when Samuel Snow comes, he has a new message. Okay, so what wakens the virgins, let's be clear, based upon Millerite history, what awakens the virgins is a prophetic message. It's not an angelic being, even if, you, even if there is a way to symbolize a message, like three angels with an angel, the nuts and bolts of it is it's a prophetic message that is directly connected to the message of the hour. The message of the hour for the Millerites was Daniel 8.14, and Samuel Snow's message was the information that allowed them to specifically identify not only the year, but the day of the year that the 2300 years ended. It allowed them to calculate October 22nd, 1844. That was the midnight cry message that awoken, awoke, awakened, awaked the ten virgins during the history of the Millerites. So what awakens the drunkards of Joel at the end of the world? It's a prophetic message directly connected to the message of the hour. Is our message Daniel 8.14? What's our message? Uh, their message was to announce the opening of the judgment. Our message is to announce the opening of the judgment of the living, which is also the close of the judgment. All right. So there will be a message directly connected to our message, the third angel's message, and the third angel's message is identifying the Sunday law. Right? And you boil down the third angel's message. It's a warning against receiving the mark of the beast. It can be many things, but at the surface level, it's the Sunday law. There will be new light directly connected to the message of the hour. And all Seventh-day Adventists say we're the messengers of the third angels, even if they don't know what that really means. But when Samuel Snow brought that message, not only was it new light directly connected to the message of the hour, but it had another nice subtle characteristic and that was that when that message was fulfilled when was Samuel Snow's message fulfilled? October 22nd 1844 when his message was fulfilled the door closed in the parable of the ten virgins okay so the, the midnight cry message that awakens the virgins of Adventism and the drunkards of Adventism and those that are drinking the new wine of Adventism will be new light on the message of the hour and the message of the hour is the Sunday law and when that new light is fulfilled in history the door closes on Adventism. So what's the wake-up time for Adventism? Because if you know that everyone wakes up when this message arrives then you know that it's time for the two drunkards to appear. Those that are drinking the new wine and those that are drunkards of Ephraim. What's the, what's the new light directly connected to the message of the hour that when it's fulfilled, the door closes? Daniel 11.41, brothers and sisters. We've been in the wake-up time for quite some time. Daniel 11.41, 
It doesn't just say like Revelation 13 and 11, at some point in time the United States is going to speak as a dragon and going to enforce the Sunday law. It says with the collapse of the Soviet Union, Seventh-day Adventists are required that the next thing that's going to happen in the sequence of the events connected with the close of probation is verse 41 where there's a Sunday law in the United States, at which point in time the door closes on Adventism. And when that message arrives, that midnight cry message arrives at the end of the world, you're in the wake-up time for Adventism. And this message causes a shaking and a noise, if you're going to listen to how Ezekiel sets forth. And it's followed by an outpouring of the Spirit in the second message. We've been in the wake-up time for quite some time. Awake, you, Joel, verse 1... Chapter 1, verse 5 says, Awake ye drunkards and weep and howl all ye drinkers of wine because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. 1 Corinthians 14, 32 and 33 says, And the spirits of the prophets are subject unto the prophets, for God is not the author of confusion but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. <coughs> Isaiah 28, 1, Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, and who, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. The drunkards of Ephraim that Isaiah is identifying are the, the drunkards that Joel's identifying. And where, where do we see Joel first fulfilled? Clearly in the scriptures. Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Notice what Sister White says about Acts chapter 2 and 3 in Pentecost and Testimonies to Ministers, page 66. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, said unto who? Said, uh, said unto the people that were fighting against the message of Pentecost. When Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit's being poured out and everyone's speaking in the, uh, another language to reach the brethren that are there from other countries, there's a group of men saying, Peter, you're the leader of this situation. Tell them to, to sit down and shut up. They're drunk. And what does Peter say? Ye men of Judea, and all you that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words, for these are not drunken, as you su suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, but this is that of wh which is spoken of by the prophet Joel. Read the history. The Lord was at work in His own way, but had there been such a manifestation among us, upon whom the ends of the world are come, would not some have mocked as on that occasion? Those who did not come under the influence of the Holy Spirit knew it not. To this class, the disciples seem like drunken men. Let me just have a little bit of license with the second to the last sentence there. Those who did not recognize the influence of the Holy Spirit knew it not. We're required to recognize the latter rain. And when it come, when it was fulfilled at Pentecost, the latter rain was fulfilled at Pentecost in fulfillment of Joel. One class received it, they were drinking the new wine. The other class thought they were drunk. But who was drunk? The class that didn't receive it. Okay, when the, Joel is talking about the manifestation of two classes of worshipers and what produces and manifests those two classes of worshipers is the introduction of a prophetic message. This is the everlasting gospel. And the everlasting gospel produces two types of drinkers of wine. Okay. Um, new wine, under new wine, page 43. This, there's, there's, of course, several places to pull out commentary on new wine in the scriptures, but I like this one. No man putteth a piece of new cloth into an old garment, for that which is put in to fill up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine in old bottles, bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. Ah, drop down to the bottom of the page. I was looking for Luke, all right? Luke 5, this is the one I like. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth the new, for he saith the old is better. Okay, I, I don't want to hear this. I know what the three angels' message is. I don't want to hear this, this stuff. I don't believe there's going to be a marked manifestation of the power of God as there was in former times. 
I'm drunk. I'm not, I'm not going to the next page yet. I'm going to go back to Desire of Ages 279 where she says, The teachings of Christ, though it was represented by the new wine, was not a new doctrine, Amen. but the revelation of that which had been taught from the beginning. Amen. But the, to the Pharisees, the truth of God had lost its original significance and beauty. To them, Christ's teaching, teaching was new in almost every respect. And it was what? Amen. Unrecognized Amen. and unacknowledged. Because they were drunk. Now to page 44. Christ's Object Lessons 127, 128. In every age there is a new development of truth. A message of God to the people of that generation. The old truths are all essential. New truth is not independent of old, but an unfolding of it. It is only as the old truths are understood that we can comprehend the new. When Christ desired to open to his disciples the truth of his resurrection, he began at Moses and all the prophets and expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. But it is the light which shines in the fresh unfolding of truth that glorifies the old. He who rejects or neglects the new does not really possess the old. For him it loses its vital power and becomes but a lifeless form. There are those who profess to believe and to teach the truths of the Old Testament, but while they reject the new. Who's that? Who is it? Think broader. There are those who claim to believe and teach... No, no, there are those who profess to believe and teach the truths of the Old Testament while they reject the New. Who rejects the New Testament? The Jews, all right? The Jews don't want anything to do with the New Testament, do they? But in refusing to receive the teachings of Christ, they show that they do not believe that which patriarchs and prophets had spoken. Had you believed Moses, Christ said, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Hence, there is no real power in their teaching of even the Old Testament. Many who claim to believe and teach the gospel are in a similar error. They set aside the Old Testament scriptures of which Christ declared, they are they which testify of me. In rejecting the old, they virtually reject the new, for both are parts of the inseparable whole. Who's that? Protestantism, right? Basically, the Protestants have rejected the old and they're New Testament Christians. You ever heard that expression? No man can rightly present the law of God without the gospel or the gospel without the law. The law is the gospel embodied and the gospel is the law unfolded. The law is the root. The gospel is the fragrant blossom and the fruit which it bears. So some of you were just when I was saying, you know, if you don't accept the New Testament, you only teach the old, or if you reject the old and teach the new, and I asked those questions, some of you, I heard some Adventists out there. Those weren't Adventists, that's the Jews and Protestants, right? Well, what do Adventists do? <laughs> it's an easy question. I was in this room, I was in this room about I don't remember these things, six years ago roughly, and we had a meeting on Daniel 11, 40 to 45. And at the beginning of the meeting, the, the week-long meeting was going to be for a brother appointed by the General Conference to explain the last six verses of Daniel 11, stand right here and give his explanation for 45 minutes, and at the end, he was going to answer questions to this room here for 30 minutes. And when he was done, then I would get up and do Daniel 11, 40 to 45 for 45 minutes, and then I'd ask questions, answer questions for 30 minutes, and we went back and forth, back and forth. It was half general conference employees and half self-supporting ministries and one spy that got in the door. All right? But that's another story. <laughs> okay. But at the very first meeting in this room, a famous guy, a famous theologian in Adventism that you would all know. He stood right about where Brother Dewey is back there, and he stood up and he says, Brothers, I want you, this was opening statements for anyone that wanted to make one. He says, Brothers, I want you to all understand, I do not know what the last six verses of Daniel 11 represent. I haven't studied it. And I'm here to learn. I'm a learner. But I want you to know from the outset, that when you give me your understanding of the last six verses of Daniel 11, I want the Bible and the Bible alone. I'm thinking, whoa. <laughs> this isn't non-Adventist. This is leaders, theological leaders in Adventism. And we don't want the spirit of prophecy. Mm -hmm. Jews don't want the New Testament. 
Protestants don't want the Old Testament. Adventists don't want the spirit of prophecy. He who rejects the new demonstrates he hasn't got the old. Okay. The Great Controversy, 335, we've already dealt with. When the mighty angel came down on August 11, 1840, Sister White, what she says is what happened is Miller's rules were confirmed and the history of the Millerite is repeated to the very letter and there are certain rules that the line of the tribe of Judah has opened to this generation that allows them to understand the last six verses of Daniel 11, allows them to demonstrate that on September 11, 2001, the judgment of the living began, the latter rain began to sprinkle and the testing of Adventism begun and we're now in the time of our visitation. All that is based upon the rules of prophetic interpretation that the line of the tribe of Judah has been opening to his students of prophecy since 1989. And one of those prophetic truths is a triple application of prophecy. And the book of Joel is perhaps one of the most important triple applications of Bible prophecy that there is because it's the one that's nailing down when Christ changes dispensation from the earthly sanctuary to the heavenly sanctuary in the time of Pentecost, from the holy place to the most holy place in the time of the Millerites, and from the judgment of the dead to the judgment of the living on September 11, 2001. And he marks this by the outpouring of his Holy Spirit as set forth in the book of Joel. And when it has happened in those past two histories, those histories are the guides that we're supposed to be bringing together upon the testimony of two to establish what we should expect to see here at the end of the world. So I just want to touch upon these three histories in the sense that I want you to see that these three histories Sister White refers to over and over again. These three histories mean Pentecost, the Midnight Cry, the Latter Rain. They're all based upon Joel. They are the, the fulfillment of the book of Joel. Great Controversy 611. The angel who, on top of page 45, the angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. What angel is that? Angel of Revelation 18. A work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here foretold. Now she's going to compare it to what? That's the latter rain she just described. Now she's going to compare it to the midnight cry. The Advent movement of 1840 to 44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world and in some countries there was the greatest religious interest which has ever been witnessed in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century. But these are to be exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of message a warning of the third angel. The work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost. These three histories, these are the three fulfillments of Joel. So when this mighty angel comes down and the earth is lightened with his glory, what is that glory? Christ. Who said character of Christ? Okay. Angel. Everyone who wants to say character of Christ, go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, <laughs> some people are hesitant or they know. Brothers and sisters, it very well may be the character of Christ. But that's not what Sister White's saying here. It isn't. Not by the context. If you let, in this passage, that's not what she's emphasizing. She says, The angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. A work of worldwide extent. She's emphasizing a work of worldwide extent. And after she makes that statement, she says, The work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here foretold. The Advent movement of 1840 to 44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world. She's saying the glory here is the work that's accomplished at this time. And when she gets to the next paragraph, she says, The work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost. So those people that say, oh, it can't be 9-11. If that's when the angel of Revelation 18 come down, then where is it that we're seeing Christ's character lifted up among these people that are teaching this message? Well, that isn't what's being identified here. If they ask the question, can you demonstrate how this particular message you're sharing has been carried around the world since September 11, 2001? I'll say, yes. I can be in a room like this and I can point to representatives of people that are working right now in at least 20 different countries in a room 
of 90 people Amen. since September 11th, 2001. Now, I might be off in the 20. I don't want to exaggerate, but <laughs> I can think of, you know, six countries right now for certainty in Europe that there's people in this room that are dealing with. And Africa, how many countries in Africa, I'm unsure. How about China? And how many in South America? And is there anyone here from Canada and the United States? A work, when this mighty angel comes down, in Great Controversy 611, which he's emphasizing, this is when the work begins. But that work will be accomplished by men and women that are allowing the Holy Spirit to finish the work of developing the character of Christ in them perfectly so at the Sunday law they can carry the final warning message to the 11th hour workers which is a message of Christ's character. But there's a work that begins. Review and Herald July 20th, 1886. And I know that that particular part of the presentation <laughs> stepped on some toes and we'll probably have some discussions down the hall in a minute. But that's how I read it, brothers and sisters. It is with an earnest longing that I look forward to the time when the events of the day of Pentecost shall be repeated. <coughs> Any of you got time to start looking through the email dialogue? Okay. In that, they're, they're one of the reasons that I was willing to put that out there is those of you that are ministering in this message, we could give, if you've read through it you, and have been in this message very long, you can confirm that the arguments that are raised in there are pretty much the arguments that are raised. Almost everyone's in there. Okay? And one of them, one of these arguments that uh, comes up, and I forgot where I was going with this, so I'm going to just... Pardon me? You said that Pentecost should be repeated. Yeah, ah, there you go. Good for you. How, how can you be identifying that the latter rain began on September 11, 2001? Isn't that time setting? That, that's not even worth responding to that charge, all right? But you have to. But how can you be marking that the latter rain began at this point in time? Well, it, was, it is with earnest longing that I look forward to the time when the events of the day of Pentecost shall be repeated. And brothers and sisters, we just read what Peter said at Pentecost. What did he say? These men aren't drunken. This is a fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. Yes. If that history is going to be repeated, when it's repeated, the men that are drinking the new wine, they will be saying that on September 11th, 2001, the prophecy of Joel reached, it reached its perfect fulfillment. And in doing so, they will be repeating the history of Pentecost, and we're told specifically that those prophecies will be repeated. So it's not a question of whether someone will be able to identify whether the latter rain has arrived or not. No question there. When the latter rain arrives, it demands that there's men and women identifying that it has arrived. And if you don't understand that, you are reading the Bible and the spirit of prophecy incorrectly. And you remove yourself from any legitimate conversation on that subject. And you make yourself one of those that are identified as the drunkards in Joel who the new wine is cut off from their mouth. It is with an earnest longing that I look forward to the time when the events of the day of Pentecost shall be repeated with even greater power than on that occasion. John says, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. Then as at the Pentecostal season, the people will hear the truth spoken to them, every man in his own tongue. Sister Clara, where is she? She's, where, where is she? She's not here. Ah, there you are. This is, this is our, sister, our, our sister from Costa Rica. Did the Costa Ricans hear this message spoke to them in their own tongue about three weeks ago? How about uh, Brother Wolfgang? Are the people in Germany hearing it spoke in their tongue? How about Polish? How about Portuguese? 
How about Romanian, sister? Brothers and sisters, it's being done right now in their own tongue. How about Chinese, Brother Andy? Are there any, very many Chinese in the world? Many shall come from the land of Sinem, according to Isaiah. Sinem means the center country. China is the center country. It's around the world. Then as at the Pentecostal season, the people will hear the truth spoken to them, every man in his own tongue. God can bring new life into every soul that sincerely desires to serve him and can touch the lips, of, the lips with a live coal from off the altar and cause them to become eloquent with his praise. Thousands of voices will be imbued with the power to speak forth the wonderful truths of God's word. The stammering tongue will be unloosed and the timid will be made strong to bear courageous testimony for the truth. May the Lord help his people to cleanse the soul temple from every defilement and to maintain such a close connection with him that they may be partakers of the latter rain when it should be poured out. Now I know that as Seventh-day Adventists there's two classes developing but this class here what we're, what we're worrying about you hear all the ministers say it what we're worrying about is that we're studying this information and we're getting an intellectual understanding but we may not be getting the experience that's what we talk about a lot here and rightly so okay that, that's what that's where our concern should lie but if you have the intellectual study understanding of this message then you have a proof concerning the inspiration of the spirit of prophecy that only someone in this message could recognize. And what do I mean? I mean, for a human being, Ellen White, for a human being to write that paragraph, that's not human. Okay, that's not human. If you're familiar with this message, she just took so many prophecies. You know, when I, when I analyzed this the first time, you look at the subtitle, what I just read on 45, the last quote. She just put Pentecost in one paragraph along with Joel, along with Revelation 18, and Ezekiel 37, and Isaiah 6, and Isaiah 28, and the latter rain. She put them all in one paragraph. And after I took that paragraph and put that head title in there, there's other, there's other lines and prophecies in there too that I missed the first time through. And I tell you what, human beings can't do that. She's taken all the passages of Scripture that are important to this message and she put it into one paragraph telling us that Pentecost was a fulfillment of Joel and that Pentecost is repeated here at the end of the world. Because Pentecost is a triple application of prophecy that's identifying this time period and this time period all the prophets in the Bible spoke of. You read that paragraph on your own time. It's profound what's in there. Got a long quote from Early Writings, page 259, 260. I'm not going to read it. But this is that, that same three, threefold history. The first paragraph is a classic paragraph we, that we use in this message where Sister White talks. She was, about, she was thrown, shown three steps. The first, second, third angel's <coughs> message. And she identifies the platform and the foundation. Which are these truths. The foundation and platform are these truths specifically on the 1843 chart. The 1850 chart is the foundations and the pillars. But in this first paragraph she says that men are going to att attempt to change the foundations. Okay, so this first paragraph, are all the prophets speaking about the end of the world? This first paragraph is a warning about the end of the world. She's saying there was foundational truths, a platform built at the beginning of Adventism that was going to get attacked as the history of Adventism proceeded and the four insects did their progressive destruction, filling up the cup of Adventist iniquity. She gave warning. She gave warning to this and as soon as she sets this prophetic warning out, the next paragraph she goes into the history of Christ and she talks about a three-step testing process in the history of Christ. She says, if you didn't accept the message of John the Baptist, you could not be benefited by the teachings of Jesus. And if you didn't accept the teachings of Jesus, there was no way to get into the heavenly sanctuary. And she says the Jews were left in perfect darkness, the one that felt that progressive testing process. And then in the next paragraph, she goes into the progressive testing process of the Millerites. And she says, if you didn't receive the first angel's message, you could not be benefited by the second angel's message. And neither were you going to be benefited by the midnight cry, which was going to show you the way into the most holy place. So what she has done there, the first paragraph, she's talking about the history of the latter rain, our history. And she says, make sure you understand our history and understand it in the history, the historical context of Christ and Pentecost. 
The only people that received the outpouring in Christ's time at Pentecost were people that successfully navigated a three-step testing process where they ended up in a position where they could receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in fulfillment of the book of Joel. And if they didn't, they were left in perfect darkness. Then she goes to the history of the Millerites. Same thing. Three-step testing process. If you don't manage that testing process correctly, you're not moving into the most holy place with Christ and you're going to have Satan answering your prayers. Those three histories are the history of Joel. Joel is a triple application of prophecy. And in that context, she's telling us that part of this three-step testing process is at the end of the world has to do with the foundations of Adventism. And sure enough, we're here. We're here. Next quote from Sister White on page 47. Evangelism 6.13 and many are doing the same today in 1897 because they have not had an experience in the testing messages comprehended in the first, second, and third angels' messages. These messages are tests. Many who went forth to meet the bridegroom under the first and second angels refused the third, the last testing message to be given to the world. She ties this three test, step testing process in with the parable of the ten virgins. Next page. I think we've read this before. Let both tares and wheat grow together until the harvest. Then it is that the angels do the work of separation. The angels are the three angels' messages that separate the wheat from the tares, the wise and foolish virgins in Adventism as the everlasting gospel is accomplished both in the history of Christ, the history of the Millerites, and our history in fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. The next quote is a powerful quote. I've got to read it even though I'm out of time. I then saw the third angel, said my accompanying angel, fearful is his word, awful is his mission. He is the angel that is select the wheat from the tares and seal or bind the wheat for the heavenly garner. These things should engage the whole mind, the whole attention. Again, I was shown the necessity of those who believe we are having the last message of mercy, being separate from those who are daily receiving or imbibing new air. Did she really write that? I saw that neither young nor old should attend the assemblies of those who are in error and darkness. Said the angel, let the mind cease to dwell on things of no profit. Amen. Amen. Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 4, 1175, Acts 2, 12-21 quoted. If this prophecy of Joel met a partial fulfillment in the days of the apostles, we're living in a time when it is to be even more evidently manifest to the people of God. He will so bestow His Spirit upon His people that they will become a light amid moral darkness and great light will be, re be reflected in all parts of the world. This triple application of prophecy, I'm not, I can't read these, I'm out of time, is also represented in the fact that in the history of Pentecost, the first fulfillment of Joel, Christ cleansed the temple at the beginning and the end of His ministry. In the history of the Millerites, He twice cleansed the temple. There's two doors closes in the Millerite history. Those doors are closing against the work of Christ in cleansing His temple. Christ cleanses the temple according to Sister White and Desire of Ages by allowing His divinity to flash through His humanity. And on August 11th, 1840, a mighty angel came down out of heaven and Sister White says it's no less a personage than Jesus Christ. And He empowered the first angel's message. And by June of 1842, the Protestants had closed the door and the first temple cleansing was done. And then in August of 1844, the midnight cry, the latter rain, was poured out upon the Millerites. And two months later, the door was closed. And Christ had accomplished the second temple cleansing in that history. And on September 11, 2001, the mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down. And the work began. And the first temple cleansing of Adventism was underway. And it ends at the Sunday Law when the door closes on Adventism. And at that point, the wheat and tares are separated and the Holy Spirit is poured out without measure. And thus divinity is flashed through humanity for a second time in our history. And the second temple cleansing of the Protestant world takes place. And it continues until the door is closed when Michael stands up. And these two temple cleansings that's in the history of Pentecost, the history in the Millerites, and our history today are a fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. For Joel is a triple application of prophecy. Page 51, under recognize. 
Only those who are living up to the light they have will receive greater light unless we are daily advancing in the exemplification of active Christian virtues. We shall not recognize the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the latter reign. It may be falling on hearts around, all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the new wine that you've opened up to your people at this time in history. We know that we have reached the, the fourth generation of Adventism. The insects have done their work. And we, we understand that it's also the time period of Laodicea and that there's awaken, and an awakening that has to take place in each of us individually as well as your people. And that this awakening is accomplished through your prophetic word. And then there's a, a change in of our, our experience that needs to take place which is also accomplished through the power of your word that's received into our hearts and minds. We ask that you would give us the, the hunger and the thirst to drink this new wine, eat this honey, that this empowerment of understanding of this message and the experience that comes with this message might be provided for each of us. But we also understand that at this time, in fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel, that there's going to be a majority of our brothers and sisters that think that we are drunk. We ask that you would grant us the, the forehead of a, an adamant, a forehead of a diamond that you have promised to those that would eat this little book and carry this message to the house of Israel, that we might accomplish this work speedily and be about um, the work of bringing in the 11th hour workers that we might soon be with you upon the scene of, sea of glass. We thank you for the new wine so far this week and ask that you would continue to provide it to us and continue to bless this, these daily meetings as well. In Jesus' name, amen.